We have a Patreon now. We do have a Patreon now. We're here ahead of the episode. The episode is happening in just a second. So just give us a minute to tell you that we have a Patreon now. We have a Patreon now. <laughs> You're welcome. On our Patreon, you can find bonus episodes every month, outtakes from our existing episodes, including the coveted Morgan Barista rant from our Legends of Nartos episode, <laughs> playlists inspired by the books that we've read on the show, and some other occasional extras such as Morgan's beautiful annotations in their books, that kind of thing. It is on a pay-what-you-want basis, because we believe that in podcasting there should be no barriers to that sort of thing. If you want to be able to enjoy the content, you should be able to enjoy the content. So if you subscribe at the lowest tier, you get all the content. But if you want to give us more money, we definitely won't say no. You know, we have to buy a lot of books for the show. So. <laughs> yeah, this job is expensive. <laughs> if you would like to check it out, the link is in the show notes. Or you can just search on Patreon The Hidden Bookcase. Welcome to the secret extra bookcase. Yeah. up a ladder. The hidden hidden bookcase. Yeah. Behind the hidden bookcase is a second secret bookcase. Oh wait, no, there's a fireplace. Ooh. Maybe if you move a brick in the fireplace, then the fireplace opens up and it's a staircase. That descends yeah. to the hidden hidden bookcase. Yeah. Okay, well, you know how to find us now, either through the fireplace or through the link in the show notes if you want to be boring. So we hope to see you over there. See you soon. And on with the episode. Welcome to the hidden bookcase. Come through and get cozy. Pick a book, your favourite book, that's the one that opens this room. Inside, you'll find a warm fire, a loving cat, and a wide skylight to the stars. And a dangerously high to be red pile. I'm Morgan, I use they them pronouns, and I am a blood soaked dress. I'm Soren, I use he, him pronouns, and I am Revenged by Boar. We've been friends for over a decade and are always swapping books. Each fortnight, we take an intense to recommend one another a favourite read. The first time reader tells us what they know about the book, makes some predictions about what they don't, and then we discuss our thoughts with all of you bookworms. This month is Greek mythology retellings. So today, let's get to talking about... Daughters of Sparta by Claire Haywood. Morgan, what are we talking about today? Today we're talking about Daughters of Sparta by Claire Hayward. It's a crazy thing, actually. I had this friend and he was working at this bookshop and he was like, oh my God, I have this book. Do you want it? And I was like, oh my God, yeah, Greek mythology retelling. And then for once, I actually kind of read it kind of fast after I received it, which was crazy. And then I really loved it and I gave it five stars. And that friend was Soren. The best friend anyone could know. <laughs> <laughs> And can you tell us what Daughters of Sparta is about? Daughters of Sparta is about Helen of Troy and Clytemnestra, two princesses who are very famous for being awful women in Greek mythology. And this is a retelling that actually tells their story from their point of view and gives reasons as to why they have been perceived that way and makes the point that they are just women and life was awful and men are even worse. <laughs> <laughs> Send with all the love. Of course. I also feel like I need to tell everybody I literally have so many source books for this episode. I'm coming prepared. Good, because I have so many questions. Oh, but I love teaching about Greek mythology. I love telling people and info dumping about Greek mythologies. This is my happy place. Okay, before I assail you with questions, let's rewind to when I hadn't read the book. Okay, I know comically little about Daughters of Sparta, given that I actually gave Morgan their copy of it, but it was literally just a damaged book that I picked up from work, so I didn't know anything about it apart from the fact that it was some kind of Greek mythology retelling, and I knew that was relevant to their studies and interests, so I just thought I'd give it to them. It's called Daughters of Sparta. I thought that Helen was Helen of Troy, but I'm thinking that it might be about Clytemnestra and Helen, who maybe were originally Spartan? And then the Trojan War gets kicked off because Helen ends up in Troy. I'm very, very shaky on the Trojan War, if that wasn't obvious. But because it's both of them, I'm expecting it to maybe be like a split POV type thing. Uh, we get both Clytemnestra and Helen's insight into it. The sort of tagline is two sisters parted and two stories proclaimed. So I, I don't really know what Clytemnestra is about or what she was doing when Helen is... Uh, being kidnapped or being, what's the word, eloping, or whatever it is, because obviously there's different interpretations of how consensual that was. But I'm excited to find out, and do I have any world predictions for this? I don't 
think I do. You know what? Okay, my wild prediction is background lesbianism. Like some lesbians, but they're gonna be kind of like peripheral. That's my random prediction. No background lesbians in Sparta? Because they were very gay, weren't they? They were more gay in ancient history rather than ancient mythology. Damn. Yeah, that was more like a tactic for making people fight better. Was like, you're gonna care more if you are emotionally invested in the people you're fighting with. So yeah, sure, you can sleep with them. So very sadly, no background lesbians. I find it interesting. Yours has a tagline that's two lines long. Mine has a tagline that's three lines long. My tagline is... Two sisters parted, two women blamed, two stories reclaimed. Oh, they dropped two women blamed. I don't feel like Clytemnestra is particularly blamed. It's more of a receptions thing. Throughout history, Clytemnestra and Helen have been the ultimate terrible wives. You know, Clytemnestra kills her husband. Oh, she does? Yeah. For some reason, I thought that he died at Troy. No, no. So Agamemnon comes home. He's the first Greek hero to return home. All the others get delayed at the beach for a bit. He manages to make it home. What are they delayed by? By the winds, by the gods. Ah, okay. But Agamemnon is murdered by his wife in the bath. She throws a net over him. She is like the ultimate terrible wife in Greek mythology. And it's interesting because like Helen is also the ultimate terrible wife because she, quote unquote, causes the Trojan War by running off with... Paris. But then they're also both related to Penelope, who is the wife of Odysseus and is the ultimate paragon of wifedom. So they're sort of the three Greek wives of mythology, and they sort of are three points of a triangle. Yeah, for some reason, I had in my head that Agamemnon died in the war. So I was like, she has nothing to worry about with this little murder plot. It's fine. And then he <laughs> came back, and I was like, oh god. Oh no. The main source for that is Agamemnon. It's the first of the Oresteia, which is the three plays by Aeschylus. So Agamemnon is the one where Agamemnon shows up and Clytemnestra murders him. And then you have the Libation Bearers, which is when Electra and Orestes show back up and are like, let's murder her because she murdered our dad. And then eventually Orestes is chased to Athens by the fates for committing matricide. Having said that, I now have an awful feeling that I'm pulling also from Sophocles' Electra and Euripides' Electra. Definitely Agamemnon is the one where Clytemnestra kills Agamemnon. Fair. I know enough about Greek mythology to find certain things amusing, or just certain other things to blindside me. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that Clytemnestra was related to Electra in any way, but I know Electra's whole deal. <laughs> So when she was like, I've had a second daughter, adorable little Electra, I was like, oh no. Yep. <laughs> Coming at it from a psychology perspective, you're just like, oh, Freud's going to have a field day with this one. Shall we talk about the cover? Yes. The hardback is very pretty. Yes, yeah, so I have the hardback, which is sort of an orangey colour, lots of leaves, because leaves were very in vogue, especially for mythology covers. I feel like that was when that anniversary edition of The Song of Achilles came out, which also had like shiny gold leaves. Mm, yeah, and then you've got Ariadne, Jennifer Saint, but I really like the paperback cover. I don't own it, but I kind of wish I did. I like the paperback a lot. I like the blue and the gold. It looks like it's a reference to Greek pottery. You know, I'm just going to start asking you questions, because why not? Oh my god, yes. One thing that really did surprise me here, they're in Sparta, so women get combat training, right? Like, that's the thing that everybody knows about Sparta. That is mythology versus history. The Trojan War is set in about the 12th century to 13th century BCE, the height of the Bronze Age, the Age of Heroes, just before the Dark Ages, when everything sort of falls to the ground. Yeah. And then the Iliad itself was composed in the 8th to 7th century BC and was sort of romanticising this very distant past by collating a bunch of oral stories about this mythical war that possibly did or did not happen in some aspect. And then it wasn't written down until about the 6th century BCE. So we had two, three centuries between the writing and the actual composition. Mm -hmm. And then it was filtered through a bunch of medieval monks for years and years and years. And then we get it in its current form. Sparta that we learn about in school with combat training for women and stuff like that, that is 5th century BCE Sparta. Ancient mythological Sparta very mm. different to what we learn about in school. Damn, I am a little bit disappointed. But that was basically when Greece was just a bunch of city-states in a trench coat who were like, yeah, we'll get together because we hate the East, so we're going to mm -hmm. go wail on them and steal their money because we think they're stupid. And we think they look very frivolous and sort of quote-unquote gay in their very colourful clothes. <laughs> That's my explanation of the Trojan War. <laughs> You're welcome. Nothing gay about throwing the discus in the nude, but you know what is gay? 
wearing yellow. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so that that is Sparta. Mm-hmm. Did I have any other predictions that are worth talking? I don't really feel like I did. It was it was a split POV. It was interesting because it didn't necessarily oscillate with perfect symmetry. I thought that was good. There were a couple of times where I was like, no, I wanted to get this person's perspective on this thing, but I think that's normal. Yeah, I kind of get frustrated by dual POVs, which religiously stick to one, then one, then one, then one, because you always get cut off in the middle of things. You get really jarred. But with this, it was sort of like we're going to spend a bit more time with Clytemnestra and now with Helen, and it's sort of a yeah nice flow but also it's really interesting to see what wasn't discussed in this book like at all there's no trojan horse for example yeah i was very surprised by that but it makes sense that Helen wouldn't really have the opportunity to see it well this is the thing is there is an episode we get it from the aeneid in which helen walks around the trojan horse and calls out to each of the men she thinks could be inside in the voices of their wives to try and tempt them into leaving at what point did helen become a perfect mimic It's very much like plays into this witchcraft element that is sometimes folded into her character. It's also very strange because surely if you think there are men inside, open it. Yeah. But also then maybe you're violating a gift to the gods. So maybe opening it is a violation. So you have to try and tempt them out. But also like... (laughs) I feel like you should explain this part because I know this, but not everyone will know this. People are always like, they're so stupid to bring the horse in. So why did they bring the horse in, Morgan? Why were they not like this as a trap? Because there's this guy who's hanging out on the beach (laughs) who has been like beaten within an inch of his life by the Greeks. And they're like, hey what's up with this horse and also why are all the Greeks gone and this guy's like they like prayed to the gods and the gods were like you need to leave and the only way that you're not going to piss off the gods is if you leave this gift I'm totally telling the truth because I hate the Greeks definitely I haven't been paid to say this God's honest truth and then (laughs) literally there's this guy called Laocoon who's like a priest who's standing there going um beware Greeks that bear gifts this is a terrible idea there's definitely people inside there and literally as they're pulling the horse along it like hits a bump and the men inside go ah but like the gods turn away the sight of the trojans so they don't hear the ah Nocorn like throws a spear at the horse to be like look there's like somebody inside and then um a sea serpent comes out of the waves and eats his sons and <laughs> the trojans are like mm, yeah Nocorn was wrong we need to bring the horse inside <laughs> <laughs> This is just such important information. I love Larkorn so unironically. He's so funny to me. <laughs> and then a serpent eats his sons in one go. Like, were they all just standing there in a line? And then it was just like, like Pac-Man? I think he's got two sons. It's like a jaw-headed serpent. It's uh, the Aeneid book two, The Fall of Troy, which is one of my favourite books of the Aeneid. It's just so entertaining. I mean, terrible for him. Rip. But also... <laughs> it's so funny. It is, to be fair. Yeah, so they bring it inside because they think it's sacred to Athena and it's a sign that they've won. And to be fair, you you don't want to make Athena mad at you. You really don't. So that was an interesting thing to leave out, is the fact that the horse just does not get mentioned at all. Yeah. Mm. Which I think, like, considering the way that Helen is written in this, Mm. having her be aware of all these men's names and who their wives are and what they sound like when she's never left Sparta in her entire life before this, it doesn't make sense. So I kind of love this version of her. Yeah. And also, I think there's some willful ignorance on Helen's part because she feels responsible for this. So she doesn't like hearing about it and she doesn't go to the gates to watch because engaging with it is extremely painful. There's multiple scenes in the Iliad where she does actually go onto the walls and watch the fighting and she sits with Priam, king of Troy, and he's like, tell me the names of all of these heroes and who they are and what they've done. And is relatively kind to her comparatively to everyone else, despite the fact that she's quote unquote the reason everything's falling apart. I'm kind of sad that we missed out on the Priam-Helen relationship because that is such an interesting part of that myth. It's given a lot to Hector in this role, I think. Yeah, I was going to say, it seems like Hector gets that relationship with her where he's like a little bit softer about the whole situation. Yeah, he's also fairly soft about it in the Iliad as well, but in a different way where people are like, oh, she was definitely actually in love with Hector by now. And it's like, calm down. <laughs> she hates herself. She literally spends that entire scene going, ah, oh, slut that I am. I can't believe that I am the cause of this. I'm so terrible. Paris, why are you such a piece of <laughs> go fight in the war? And Hector's like, yeah, she's right. Go fight in the war. And Paris is like, oh, this is so hard for me. <laughs> it's a comedy if you try hard enough. I mean, to be fair, the scene where Paris just sort of jets in the middle of the fight <laughs> was quite comedic. This is the thing I actually want to talk about, because this is a historical fiction reimagining of the Iliad, Mm -hmm. which some people have done it, but they've done it in a way of like, oh my god, you thought that the gods were real? Let me tell you what actually happened. And it's very much like even the characters in the narrative don't believe in the gods, which is just unrealistic. 
Mm. So reimagining this as a historical fiction where the gods are actually very important to the narrative and all of the characters believe. And also, if you look hard enough, there are lots of little bits which could potentially be divine influence. For example, when Helen and Menelaus go to the cave to try and get a child and Helen spits on the altar afterwards and is like, yeah. I hope that I never have kids. And obviously she doesn't have kids. So that's maybe divine influence. Or it's not a punishment to Helen to not have kids. Immediately after that, Clytemnestra has two stillbirths. So is it the goddess punishing her sister instead because she knows that punishing Helen for desecrating her altar is actually a gift? Yeah. That's an interesting little thing. The scenes with all the fighting, especially because that's so much part of the Iliad the gods coming in and messing things up, the sword shattering and Paris running away. In the original, Paris is literally spirited away before he can be stabbed by Aphrodite because she's like, "Mm, I like him. Don't stab him, please. And she spirits him all the way back to his chambers with Helen and Helen's there like, really? Really? So it's really interesting to see how she sort of rewrites it. It could be no godly influence or if you wanted to read it in, there could be, which is something that she does really well in all of her books, all two of her books, but she does it really (laughs) well finding that exact balance between reading godly influence into it, but also having potentially a mundane explanation. Yeah. Which is really cool. I loved that. You can easily see why somebody would believe in the gods and they wouldn't be stupid for doing so. Mm. It would have been interesting to have one atheist knocking around. I just think that would have been funny. (laughs) I actually have a whole book on atheism in the ancient world by Tim Whitmarsh. It's one of my favourite nonfiction books just because it's one of the only nonfiction books I've ever read in its entirety. Like, that's the green flag. Nonfiction can be hard to get through. Yeah. So. It's more kind of like a potted history of ancient Greece and ancient Rome, but it also mm. has a lot of stuff about the original philosophical thinkers and then also how Rome transitioned to Christianity. I would definitely recommend it. There's going to be a lot of nonfiction wrecks in this episode, unfortunately, because I'm too much of a nerd. <laughs> I'm going to be like, <laughs> the Greek mythology retellings, let me tell you about the Iliad. <laughs> What's the phrase? It's like letting <laughs> letting you out into a field to like run around. I feel like a golden retriever. I'm getting enrichment in my enclosure. Exactly. <laughs> These are the Morgan enrichment in our enclosure episodes, which, you know, should really be every episode. Shall we talk about characters? Who's your favourite? Who's your favourite character, sorry? I asked you first. Oh, no. My favourite character is Clytemnestra. When I was about 16, I went to see a performance of the Oresteia, which is the three plays from which a lot of Agamemnon and Clytemnestra and Orestes and Electra's story comes. And I saw it at the Globe. And there's this very vivid moment because Clytemnestra is dressed in this black and white geometric dress. It's just absolutely beautiful. And the thing about Greek drama is that all of the action happens off stage, And then characters will come back on stage and report what has happened, especially deaths. They'll go off stage and they'll come back and be like, my lord is dead. This is how it happened. And you're like, okay. And then the chorus are like, whoa, terrible times. And they're singing and it's great. But Clytemnestra is dressed in this black and white dress. And then she goes off stage and you hear all these screams. And then she comes back on stage and it's the same dress, but all of the white bits are red. And she's just like covered head to toe in just like gore and like fake blood and her like black hair is like sticking together and she wheels on this sort of jumbled bag of meat where you can just like see a rib cage sticking out and then she makes this whole declaring speech and I have been obsessed with her since I saw that. That's very fair. She's so real. She's so valid. Her husband murdered her daughter and she spends 10 years sleeping with this other rival being a really good queen. Yeah. And then plotting his murder. And I kind of wish she'd been more ruthless and more actively planning the whole time. But I understand we're trying to go for pure sympathy. And most people don't have the same female rage kink that I do. Oh no, I was so like, come on, kill him, kill him. He kills your daughter. Exactly. I love Clytemnestra. She's one of my favourite mythological characters. Second only to Medea, um, which you can very quickly see a theme going on there. Also a good choice. Misunderstood female characters in mythology who are just full of rage. I like how a minute ago we were like, well, Agamemnon deserved to die because he killed his daughter. And now we're like, well. (laughs) Medea did nothing wrong. (laughs) There are different versions of the myth because that's the Euripides myth of him saying, yeah, she just murdered them. Whereas there's other versions where Jason murders them or other Mm. versions where she like resurrects them again. Or other versions where she just runs away with them and then they go on to found magic in the Thracian kingdoms. There's so many other versions, but we get so stuck on the Greek drama ones because they're the ones that survive in entirety. Whereas like Mm. a lot of this other stuff is like fragmentary stuff that I learned about my magic module last year. Very cool. I did not know this. Yeah, there are some really good bits about Medea. But yeah, 
Clytemnestra, my beloved. I love her so much. She's really pathetic in Euripides' version as well. Agamemnon, at least, she's very much like hardened villain. She's got all the good monologues. Whereas in Electra, and she's there being like, I'm so sad. Don't stab me. And then Orestes literally like covers his eyes and stabs her blindly. Damn, connecting that to this, especially with this portrayal of her as someone that loved Orestes very, very much and was trying to do what was best for him. It's devastating. Electra is just so inexcusable in every iteration. I haven't read Jennifer Saint's Electra yet, but I do not see how you can make her sympathetic when Clytemnestra did nothing wrong. <laughs> Listen. Definitely in this version, she was really trying her best every step of the way in terms of conforming but then also in terms of like when she saw the Artemis priestess girl who was taken into the palace and yeah she was initially jealous of her but she was also like oh I need to get her out for her own sake and that was like her primary motivation. She's so full of empathy for other women. She's trying so hard and she pushes down all that jealousy that she could feel. Yeah. And I love her so much. Who's your favourite character? I think it was also Clytemnestra. I did like how Helen was portrayed. I feel like mm. Clytemnestra felt like a more cohesive portrayal, but not necessarily in a bad way, because I feel like Helen was quite contradictory as a person, deliberately, mm. because she was in this weird position where she was universally beloved, but then also didn't have any love in her personal life. Yeah. She is such a divisive character in mythology because, mm. you know, she is the face that launched a thousand ships. But then obviously most people by now recognize that the Trojan War was not motivated by a single woman. It was motivated by we want money. And this is an excuse. It's a fantastic excuse because everyone has to be in on this now because you all made no. Yeah. But all the Trojans need someone to blame and they're not yeah. going to blame a prince. No. Paris's excuse for like robbing the treasury was so flimsy. Helen, this is the biggest red flag. <laughs> She's so naive, yeah. but like it's just so funny because he's there just robbing blind and it And then he's like, I thought you would want like a memento, so I took like the entire treasury because I love you. I do find it interesting how we don't get any of Paris's backstory in this because it would be quite hard. How are we gonna talk about these apples? What is Paris's backstory? Oh, oh boy. So. Oh, I wish you guys could see Morgan's expression. Priam has this kid. Okay. And there's a prophecy that goes, hey, this kid is going to be the downfall of Troy. Just to warn you. Priam's like, okay, cool. We'll leave him on a mountain to die. Great. You know, classic Greek mythology move yeah. to avoid a prophecy. It's the same thing with Oedipus. So they leave him on a mountain to die. Yeah. And then a shepherd finds him and is like, oh no, this poor child, and raises him as a shepherd. Oh, and then, I can't remember which comes first, but I believe Zeus. Do you know the story of the golden apples? It's one of the labours, right? Rewind slightly. Achilles' parents' wedding. So this is Peleus and Thetis. Mm -hmm. Romance of a century because, you know, it's not romantic at all. It was complete entrapment. Yes. But all of the gods are there. But the one person who doesn't get an invite is Eris, who is the goddess of discord. Mm -hmm. So she shows up with this apple, writes for the fairest on it, throws it into the middle of the party. The three goddesses who find it are Athena, Aphrodite, and Hera. They all pick it up and assume it's for them. They go, mm, Zeus, you need to decide who this is for. And he goes, mm, I'm not doing that. I value my life. So he goes and finds a random mortal who he thinks that might have good judgment. Paris, because Paris is a shepherd. He's grown up on the mountains. He's going to be the perfect person to judge these three goddesses. He knows all about which <laughs> goddesses are the most beautiful from his days of looking at sheep. Mm -hmm. So he's told to pick the fairest. They all offer him things. Aphrodite goes, I can give you the love of the most beautiful woman on the earth. Oh. And he goes, I'll have that one. Thank you very much. At some point, either before this or after this, Paris goes back to Troy and is like, hey, I'm still alive. And they're like, well, he's grown up now. We can't really kill him. Like, he's our son. You can't kill an adult, but you can kill a baby. <laughs> <laughs> so they welcome him back in wow. and make him a prince. Did they just tell him that they were going to kill him? Or were they just like, wow, that must have been like some crazy mistake. No, I don't think they tell him the prophecy. I think they're like, oh, it must have been a mistake because he's here and nothing's burning. The point is, he then immediately go kidnaps Helen and brings her back. And they're like, oh, no. And then the Trojan War happened and Troy falls. I kind of wish they'd brought that in. That would have been so funny. He's actually only been a prince for five minutes. Exactly. Also, when he's like, wow, you outshine Aphrodite, he means it because he's seen her, one. And two, he's also taking a massive risk by saying that because he also knows what she's like. Oh yeah, comparing people to Aphrodite is like going, hey, smite her, please. Paris is a terrible person. Mm. Also, he's the one who kills Achilles. 
which I feel like is quite a big thing yeah. that maybe should have been mentioned. He would have had bragging rights for a while, even if he's done nothing for 10 years. But then again, that's another thing. We don't get any of Patroclus and Achilles. Uh, I was kind of hoping we would get like a little cameo. We're the only hero of them. This is the thing. I understand not putting mm-hmm. them in because like they've like taken over three times the Trojan War so yeah. much. But there's this whole bit where Hector is wounded and Achilles has murdered two kids and Hector's like I must go and kill him and immediately gets killed completely skips out the bit that Achilles used to be a very honourable man Mm. and only starts killing indiscriminately when Hector kills Patroclus it's like what happened to Patroclus (laughs) this is quite a big motivator (laughs) yeah I mean I guess you can make the argument that like maybe Helen wouldn't be hearing about it because those details wouldn't be discussed I liked her perspective on Cassandra's whole business it was really fun because mm. if you know what's going on with Cassandra, you're like, oh no. <laughs> Heywood is definitely like really implying. She's like, oh, I think the war will be over soon. And then they're like, yeah, we're going to win it. And she's like, I didn't say we were going to win it. I love Cassandra. Is that how she dies in the original myth? I was aware, obviously, that Cassandra dies tragically, but I wasn't aware of the circumstances of that tragic death. Yeah, no. So Agamemnon brings her home as a war prize. He goes ahead toward the baths. And at least in the Oresteia, she gets this whole speech to the chorus where she goes, I know that I'm about to die. And they go, maybe you could not go in. And she's like, no, I have to. There will be nets. It will be really painful, but then it will be over. And it's like this really heart-wrenching moment. And then she walks off to her death. Oh my God. It's really upsetting. (laughs) Very sort of meta-narrative-y. This is the way the story goes. I have to go in. Oh, it's... I love Cassandra Mm. so much. She's so interesting. I kind of wish we'd gotten more of her because especially her backstory could have been done in a way that was historical fiction because her backstory is that she's supposed to be a priestess of Apollo. And then Apollo is like, hey, sleep with me. And she's like, no, thank you. And so he spits in her mouth and gives her this horrible curse. And that's the backstory. Grim. And that's why she's so insane, supposedly, because Apollo cursed her. Spitting in her mouth. Yeah. You know when you read a fairy tale and you're like, oh, okay, this is like a message for children. That feels like a don't make out with boys message. If you make out <laughs> with boys, you'll be cursed with knowledge of the future. Yeah. Even if he's Apollo, especially if he's Apollo. I just love Cassandra. Hayward did a very good job with the fact that these are girls and the narrative mm. keeps reminding you that they're not adult women, even though everyone's treating them like that. They still feel authentically childlike. Yeah. Cassandra in particular, I'm remembering more just because it was towards the end of the narrative, but Helen and Clytemnestra early on, stuff from their point of view. There is that nice moment where Clytemnestra calls back to seeing the lion statues mm. and being like, wow, they scared me when I got here. I've seen a lot worse. That was a very childish fear. Like, Clytemnestra's like 15 when she has her first kid. Yeah. Like, it's horrifying. I think it would have been an interesting idea to drive at home by actually having their ages at the beginning of chapters. At the beginning, I was keeping track of it because it's like however many years later, but eventually I was just like, I'm not adding things anymore. But I know that they're not that old, even by the end of the narrative. That would have been deeply upsetting in a good way. There's been a very big saturation on the market of feminist retellings recently, especially of Greek mythology, ever since Song of Achilles and the Percy Jackson generation grew up. Greek mythology is very in vogue. But there are so many feminist retellings, and yet almost every single one is still like, Helen, that who's caused the Trojan War and ruined my life personally. And I'm like, how can this be a feminist retelling? And then you treat this woman like this. Yeah. You're not deconstructing anything in your brain there. And you can have the whole excuse of like, oh, well, some women would blame her. You're not giving me anything else, though. This is actually the first retelling I ever read where it didn't treat Helen awfully. And that's because it Mm. gave us her point of view and gave us sympathetic reasoning. And I think it's difficult not to be sympathetic of Helen if you have a point of view, because can you imagine anything worse than people starting a war in your name that you did not ask for? Exactly. And also, she's literally been sheltered her entire life at Sparta. There is no way she could have any idea what would happen here. Yeah, She does not have the context of the political scape. Mm. She's literally just like, I am deeply unhappy and I need to leave. Yeah. And she's given this out. I remembered a question that I had. Mm -hmm. The parentage of Zeus thing, is that an element of some mythology? The canon here is very clearly that she has a different father and it was a non-consensual situation for her mother. But are there versions of Helen's story where she's like a demigod? Is that a thing? Yes. That's so cool. Do you know the myth of Leda and the Swan? Yes, I do know that one. You should say it anyway, because people might not know it. The myth of Leda and the Swan is that Leda is this beautiful woman and Zeus wants to sleep with her. So he turns into a swan to get close to her and then sleeps with her. And then she bears eggs. Then they turn into people. So Leda is the mother of 
Helen, Clytemnestra, Polydeuces and Castor. Oh. Basically what happens is that she gives birth to four children. Two of them are Zeus's kids and two of them are Tyndareus's kids. So Helen and Polydeuces or Pollux are the children of Zeus and Castor and Clytemnestra are the kids of Tyndareus. Oh, so okay. that's how that myth jigsaws together. It's leader in the swan. There you go. Helen came from an egg. Confirmed. <laughs> no wonder they didn't give them proper sex ed. <laughs> They're like, stay away from birds, kids. Oh, my God. <laughs> but yes, yeah, so that's why there's sort of that... Um, yeah, that's why they lean into that rumour. Yeah, lean into that rumour and weaponise it in a very interesting way, but also why Leda has this sort of sexual assault trauma. Yes. Which isn't explicitly said to be from Zeus, because obviously in this narrative, Zeus doesn't necessarily exist. It's interesting, though, because Pollux and Castor are considered the twins. They're called the Dioscori, and they become gods mm-hmm. later on in the narratives. But obviously in the Leda and the Swan myth are not twins and then in Dorsa Sparta they're literally older than all the others there's this absolutely heartbreaking moment in the Iliad when Helen's on the walls with Priam there's basically this moment where Priam goes and what about your brothers and she goes oh yes I have two brothers they must be out fighting somewhere on the battlefield Mm -hmm. and then the narrator goes she didn't know that they had been buried far from home at sea on the way to Troy multiple years ago and it's this devastating moment she's been there for 10 years and she still doesn't know her brothers are dead and they died on the way oh my god exactly i wish we'd gotten their fates because i feel like they just hang about yeah and they kind of just vanish i was also surprised by how chill they were about not being eric all men in this narrative seem to be very singularly after power but pollux and castor don't seem to give a damn that Clytemnestra is named as the heir just because they're twins. You'd think that that would cause huge problems, being like, you know, I'm an older boy and I'm a boy, so why the hell? Well, the thing is, in the chronology of mythology, yeah. not long before this happened was the Theban cycle, which is the moment in which Oedipus's kids, he has two sons who are twins called Eteocles and Polynices, and Eteocles and Polynices have to share the city because they're both the heirs. So they get one year each with the city. (laughs) That's such a bad way of doing it. Until eventually one of them goes, absolutely not, I'm not giving you back. And so the other one raises an army and attacks the city. Mm -hmm. And basically there's huge amounts of destruction until they both end up dead. Oh my God. So that's very recent cultural memory. We should talk about Agatha for a second because I just don't want to not talk about Agatha. I love Agatha. She does not deserve any of what she gets. This is very much about Helen and Clytemnestra being subjugated for their gender. But the narrative very clearly shows that subjugation being a class thing with Agatha, where she's treated mm. so much worse and they're completely blind to it. There's that moment where Agatha comes into Clytemnestra's room and is like, mm-hmm. yeah, I wasn't hurt because you blamed it entirely on me. I was hurt because... They knew it was you, but they couldn't hurt you. They could only hurt me. So either way, I was going to be... And then when they find out Theseus didn't do anything to Helen, Clytemnestra says, oh, so nothing bad came of it then. (laughs) I guess there's just their, like, am I a joke to you? It's so well handled, that intersectionality. Because you have these two very high-class women as narrators, it still manages to give you that insight into Agatha and Eudora and the other slaves that you see. The relationship between Helen and Agatha was very convincing in that Helen was like, Mm. this is kind of the only woman of my age that I still have around. So I feel this bond with her. And also later on, this is the caretaker of my child and she's doing this for me in a way that I can't. So I kind of appreciate her, but I'm also kind of deeply jealous of her. And then of course, Agatha with Menelaus then throws another complication into it. She has those very mixed feelings for her that feel very credible. I really appreciate those layers being taken into consideration with Helen and her characters. They don't have to be saints for the injustices they experience to be injustices. And indeed they shouldn't be because it just wouldn't make sense for the time in which they were raised and the way in which they were raised. And I think you have a similar point, so apologies if I froze this wrong, but reading some historical fiction that tries to be feminist, it ends up just feeling like modern feminism because it's not taking that historic bent into account and then it undermines its own point. Mm. Yeah, I like to call it hashtag feminism specifically. Now this is very good in the fact that it has very sort of era appropriate feminism, which I really, really enjoy to read. I mean, obviously, we hate to see women suffering. However, if you're going to write historical fiction, write it properly. (laughs) One thing that I will say, and I'm not sure if I've sorted out my thoughts on this, I'm just talking. So you may change Mm -hmm. my mind, or I may change my mind. I was kind of disappointed by the fact that every man ends up falling into this thing of dehumanising women. I can completely see where it's coming from in terms of that's how everyone was taught and how everyone was raised. But that pattern holds 100% true here. 
And I wonder if it contributes to a narrative that men are inherently incapable of empathising with women, incapable of being decent human beings, essentially. Which, in some way, kind of excuses that behaviour. And particularly, it would have been nice to see some men... I guess you kind of get it a bit with Paris, but it sort of becomes villainized in that like he's not as masculine mm. as the rest of the men. He cares about his clothes and his perfume, good for him. But then that's connected to his cowardice and his vanity, as opposed to like, any other man also suffering from the patriarchy. Men in this story don't really suffer from the patriarchy. They do because like it ends up killing them or whatever, but like <laughs> in a like more abstract <laughs> way. But I feel like men suffer under patriarchies in a much more direct way. I don't want this story to be about men because it's not, and it shouldn't be. Mm. But it would have been cool to see that in play, I think. It would have been more holistic. With the Paris thing, I think what we don't see is any of the Trojan culture. Mm. And what you gather from other sources, it that Trojan culture is actually way more aligned with how Paris is than how Hector is. And that's one of the reasons why Hector is so much better than everyone else at fighting, mm -hmm. because he is so different to what sort of Trojan culture values, because Trojan culture does value from the historical sources that we have more quote-unquote feminine things. I think the criticism of him comes more from you literally caused this and now you're just sitting in your room doing your hair. You take your responsibilities. To be fair, I don't feel like I got a very good idea of Trojan culture here. I feel like the anchor was Paris, mm. at least from a reading perspective, it didn't feel super different. But from a narration perspective, those are the traits that Hayward emphasised about him specifically. Yes. It would have been interesting to root more into the Trojan culture compared to the Greek culture. Yeah, and I would have quite liked to see some cultural dissonance on Helen's part because she's miles away from home, she's not got the same creature comforts that she's used to. It's going to be very, very jarring, especially if you've literally never left your home. It would have been interesting to see as well like what everyone else's reactions were to Helen showing up in Troy. Mm. Exactly. And sort of their realisation of, oh god, what have you done? Yeah, because there's a very long skip where they leave and then she's been there for like two years. Mm. On the point of all men being evil, I actually wrote about this in my diss a lot, about the villainization of masculinity in mythology and the Trojan War specifically. I think this is interesting because all the different men, while they all act misogynistically, they manifest it all in very different ways. Menelaus tries to relate to Helen, but is also awful at it. And then you see Agamemnon have these tiny moments of kindness, but still be a terrible person. Then you have Aegisthus, who's actually like, yeah, you be a girl boss, even though this is my kingdom. I'm literally just here to hype you up. But also, I haven't deconstructed all of my thinking, and I haven't deconstructed my class thinking specifically. I think it would have been interesting to see more sympathetic men, but I don't know how they would get into this book. Yeah, I completely agree with that. Yeah, where without taking focus off Helen and Clytemnestra, which I would not want. And I think also doing it from their points of view, because they feel so threatened constantly by men, mm. because, you know, they've learned to be... It would be hard for them to perceive kindness mm -hmm. from a man because they will be evaluating it as, I want something from you instead, even if it was actually kindness. No, I think that's a very good point, because as you've mentioned, there are certain moments that could be construed as tenderness with most of the men in this novel. And again, they're like, oh, is this a show of favour? But as a reader, you mm. could be like, oh, no, that's the potential of like a human person who could be better, but isn't going to be better. Yeah, It's just one moment of them being an actual human being for a second. How do we feel about the writing style? I like it. It's very accessible. Mm. Yeah, I'd be very comfortable recommending this to somebody who's not necessarily read historical fiction or feels intimidated by historical yes. fiction. I feel like somebody who reads mainly contemporary would definitely be able to read this. And I think it's good that Hayward yeah. made concessions towards that, like in the author's note she talked about. What's the other name for Troy? The actual name for Troy? Hitati. Yes. But she was like, I'm not going to call it that because nobody will know what the hell I'm talking about. Cough, cough. Um, Wrath goddess sing. Cough. Anyway. Um... <laughs> Writing style. I like it. It was very low on description, which is something that I find difficult, but I did still enjoy it. And I read it very fast. Yeah. Because I remember when I first read it, I read it way quicker than I expected mm. to. Like, I really zoomed through it. And I'm not a historical fiction girly, so I was very surprised. Yeah. You can tell that Claire Haywood is a classicist. Mm, mm hmm. The more classics retellings I read by classicists, the more I'm like, normal people should not be allowed near retellings <laughs> unless they have, like, normal people. a credential of some sort. I just don't trust people anymore. I've read too many bad retellings, specifically Greek mythology because it's so oversaturated. Don't write it unless you have something new to say 
or unless you have a background. Or maybe you're Greek. Or Greek. Please, can we have Greek mythology retellings by Greek authors? Please, there is so much room for them in the market and they just aren't being given the platform. You can't just consider Greece to only be ancient when it is literally a modern country that has a fully rich culture that didn't just stagnate 2,000 years ago. Yeah. Give Greek authors more space. Also give back the Elgin marbles, just whilst we're at it. There's a museum for them right there. Yeah, co-signed. Not that I'm passionate or anything. <laughs> no, but you're correct. Soren, as the new person to this book, final thoughts? I had a very good time. I was very absorbed. I thought the characters were very cohesive. I sometimes feel like, what's the point of seeing a character through from childhood to adulthood? Sometimes it feels like the childhood sections are a little bit irrelevant and they go on for a little bit too long. Whereas here, I'm like, ah, oh, this was very good information to set up the character and set up their arcs. And it added so much to the experience. So as buildings romance, which is a very weird thing to say about a Greek <laughs> book, <laughs> these were also very successful yeah great commentary great themes i think this is a solid four style from me morgan can you give us your final thoughts i really love it i'm not a historical fiction person but it really just sort of resonates with me we're turning you into one on the show uh, no absolutely will. not. please keep me away <laughs> i really love it i really love how much care claire hayward puts into it and how after reading so many mythology retellings which sort of look down on the idea of mythology yeah having a historical fiction retelling which doesn't do that mm. was really nice and really enjoyable to see and that respect for ancient greek religion was really refreshing and just seeing helen not villainized and seeing clytemnestra get page time and not be villainized was really really nice claire hayward is an auto buy author from me now and five stars i think we brought up the word empathy before but i think that it does come from that there's so much respect for the religion for these two as women because hayward is trying to empathize with people of that time just in a mm. non-condescending way i think that's what makes it so yeah. successful do you have any recommendations i have one that's very obvious and we've done it on the show and that's Sister Song by Lucy Holland. If you want sister relationships, if you want a little bit more of that, because I think there's definitely a relationship here, but it sort of becomes more the idea of the relationship than the relationship itself, because they're separated so early on in the narrative. But if you want mm. the messy sibling relationships to continue for a little bit longer, if you want some morally great characters, if you want feminism being discussed in a framework where, again, the characters are sort of ignoring class and it's like this intersectional thing that's being woven into the text where... They're making valid criticisms, but also they're blind to their other elements of their society. And it's all just very good and interesting. And they have very strong voices. And also, Sine and Helen just sort of feel the same to me. Maybe it's wanting to get dashed off your feet, knowing that they're like beautiful and using that to their own advantage. I feel like they would hate each other, actually. I was going to say get along, <laughs> but I'm incorrect. <laughs> I don't feel like I have that much else that immediately springs to mind for this. So I'm just going to sort of cheat because that was obviously Morgan's pick for the show back in the old days so i'm kind of stealing a recommendation from morgan but morgan's very smart i forgive you thank you <laughs> <laughs> do you have recommendations well i can give a quick list of primary sources that people should go check out we've got agamemnon by aeschylus which is from the oristia which is the clytemnestra myth we've got the iliad of course i would suggest the martin hammond translation until Emily Wilson's translation comes out in September, which will be very soon after this episode drops. The Odyssey as well has some Helen bits in book three. I would suggest the Emily Wilson translation. If you're looking for non-fiction, I would suggest Natalie Haynes's Pandora's Jar. It is basically a look through different women from Greek mythology and how they have been received and retold in different parts of history. And there is a whole chapter on Clytemnestra and on Helen. Ooh. And it's honestly one of my favourite non-fiction mythology books. And this is going to be a rogue one, considering we didn't actually get around to discussing this theme on the show. But if you really liked the theme of motherhood mm. and how different people will interact with it, A Day of Fallen Night by Samantha Shannon is high fantasy, very different vibes. But the whole theme throughout that book is how to approach motherhood from different ways. So you have lesbians vibing with their kids and you have child loss and you have this Arrowways character who needs to have an heir and how she approaches doing that while being deeply uncomfortable with the whole idea. The entire book's about motherhood. It's also got lots of dragons in it, but the central theme, which Samantha Shannon handles really well. Next episode, we are not reading a book. We are reading a play. We're reading Hades Town by Annie East Mitchell. And we're joined by a guest. We're joined by Red from Overly Sarcastic Productions. Until then, you're always welcome through the bookcase. Don't forget to scratch the cat on the way out. 
Thank you for listening to The Hidden Bookcase, a production of Planar Prod. On this episode, you heard Morgan Greensmith and Soren Brywood discussing Daughters of Sparta by Claire Haywood, with editing by Kit Lovick. You can find out more about this book at clairehaywood.info. You can find Haywood on Twitter at Claire E. Haywood. You can find The Hidden Bookcase on Twitter at Hidden Bookcase and on Instagram, Facebook, Tumblr, and TikTok at Hidden Bookcase Podcast. Find out more about Planar Prod at planarprod.com. Know what we should read next, or want to chat to us about what you thought of this episode's read? You can reach us at thehiddenbookcase at gmail.com, or send us a DM on social media. We'd love to hear from you. You can also join our community of book lovers on the Hidden Bookcase Discord. Link in our show notes. If you're enjoying the Hidden Bookcase, please consider leaving us a rating or a review, or you can always tell a friend how to find us. Your whispers are the best way for bookworms to discover our show. On our next episode, which will be out on Monday, the 28th of August, we'll be discussing Hades Town by Annie East Mitchell, alongside special guest Red from Overly Sarcastic Productions. We hope to see you then, and in the meantime, you're always welcome through the bookcase. <laughs> <laughs>